ESG, which is environmental social governance, broadly speaking, today, Dolores, is voluntary. Welcome to Truth Behind Travel Podcast. I'm Dolores Semeraro, and this is my weekly show, where tourism, travel, and hospitality industry professionals meet to discuss and share marketing strategies as they reshape the future of travel. If you want to learn the truth directly from the leaders and the doers of this industry, you are in the right place. Before you dive into today's episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. And while you're on it, go on and follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at Truth Behind Travel Podcast. Welcome to Truth Behind Travel Podcast Season 4. I'm your host, Dolores Semeraro, and this season we're focusing on impact. The impact that tourism and travel organizations have on the industry's ecosystem, its people, and the destinations. Get ready to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly side of the story in each episode. I'm really excited to unfold the conversation I've had with the podcast guest of season four. And if you want to make or are making an impact, this is where you will find like-minded experts you will want to connect with. Let's get to it. We're going to talk about the elephant in the room, the carbon emissions of tourism. But we're not pointing fingers here. In fact, we are discussing solutions. On today's episode, I'm speaking to the co-founder and CEO of Patnet Zero, Mark Dakmanton. Patnet Zero is a platform that provides carbon impact correction solutions for travel, tourism, and commercial organizations focused on CSR and ESG. Our conversation today will touch on the true impact of the whole travel experience. How does the mitigation process look like? And whether you, to put it in Mark's own words, have an appetite for legacy and can be part of a solution for the long-term well-being of all. Without further ado, let's welcome Mark. Welcome back and welcome back to season four of Truth Behind Travel podcast. There has been a bit of a pause over the past few months, a pause much needed to reset and re-strategize about what the podcast theme would be moving forward. And I'm so glad that in this new season, we are exploring what the impact of the travel and tourism industry moving forward will be and is already. And one of the biggest impacts that we often talk about it, but not in the right terms, is the impact of the carbon footprint on the environment that the travel and tourism industry seem to have and has effectively on each and every travel that we start and and finish. So today I'm really glad to have a very special guest on the podcast to have one of the probably most wanted conversation and, and a difficult one, I have to say, even for myself. Mark, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you, Dolores. It's my absolute pleasure. And thank you for inviting us. I know it was coming and I always wanted to find the right time to bring this conversation forward because I know that a lot of the operators that are listening to this podcast are already involved at some levels in what is what is their impact in terms of carbon footprint on the environment and around the work that they do in travel and tourism. But there was never an opportunity to sort of spill the beans and to really break it down and demystify this big idea and this big concept around it. And that's what we're going to do today. But before we do that, I would love for you to sort of give us a little bit of an introduction of what brought you to where you are today. What made you choose this path? In uh, early 2000, I... Um, was a sales guy. I moved into an industry which was uh, telecommunications. Uh, The actual word, Dolores, is UCNC, which is Unified Communications uh, and Collaboration. And over a period of 12 years, we we built an amazing business that was focused on collaboration. It was about video conferencing. It was about you don't need to travel. You don't need to get a plane. We can actually work together in a digital sense. Now, interestingly, my icebreaker, Dolores, is that in late 2019, I decided to leave video conferencing and move into travel. 
which normally gets a little bit of a, a, a giggle around the room because video conferencing exploded and travel went into a disaster for, for, for two years. But the reason that I went into travel was UCMC is a very affluent space and it afforded me the luxury of a hobby, which was seeing the world, seeing places I never dreamt I'd ever see, being in hotels and planes and islands and all sorts of stuff. And so when I left my, my old world, I thought, what am I going to do? I woke up. Um, you know, when, you, when you're employed and you have a job, right, it's funny, you don't realise that when you wake up, you no longer have a mobile phone or a laptop or an income or a reason to, to get dressed and leave the door. So I thought, what do I love? And I thought I love platforms, I love technology, I love the planet, and I love travel. And that's why I'm here today, because I've amalgamated those loves into the second phase of my personal career. And how did that bring you to the creation of PathNet Zero? The first iteration of my experience in travel was within a DMC, so a destination management company. And for whatever reason, Mother Nature decided that she was going to afford us some time off work over 2020 and 2021. And during that time, my business partner and I were, were looking at our products and services and we were looking at our business and we thought, right, we work from home. We're doing the best that we can in terms of the vehicles that we drive, the infrastructure that we have. What, what's the big problem that we're doing to the planet? And we operate in Southeast Asia and we predominantly sell to partners in the United Kingdom and Australia. So we thought, look, we can look at our offices, our home offices, our infrastructure, what we drive, whether we recycle, the paper that we use, the, the amount of times we print, et cetera, et cetera. And no matter what it was that we would do around our own business, the biggest impact was that we were asking partners to put people on planes, to be met at the airport, to be put on minibuses, on vans, on coaches, on private cars, to be taken to hotels, to have breakfast, have lunch, have dinner, to go on excursions, to go on tuk-tuks, to go on seaplanes in the Maldives, to sit in infinity pools and do all that sort of stuff. And we very, very quickly realised that there are two really, really key components to thinking about sustainable travel. Number one is what happens in destination is important. But number two is our business is focused on the impact of moving people around the planet because we believe that that's the single largest impact for the emissions, the carbon footprint and the impact on the planet is just the act of getting somebody there. It's not them sitting on a sunbed or going to a museum. It's just getting them there. And so that was our big, big focus in terms of how do you measure that? How do you quantify that? How do you understand it? But more importantly, how do you then think about correcting the impact of that? Because ironically, Dolores, we're travel professionals. Our business is dependent on people traveling. So we want them to, you know, ironically, we want them to get on a plane. We want them to go to a museum. We want a company to pick them up from the airport. So that, that was the, the real big driver was... Where's our impact? How do we understand that? How do you calculate it? And what do you do about it? How difficult was to reshape the business purpose in, in a way? Because, I mean, it, this is like a complete different stretch of focus, commitment, goals. Working with my DMC partner, going into the idea of PathNet Zero, going into a platform and going into a more data-driven digital space was really comfortable for me, right? Because it it's tangible that there's numbers, there's figures, there's data, there's platforms, that there's science behind it. But the science is incredibly complicated. And so we met with people and we started looking at you know, that there's multiple strings of data for planes, trains, automobiles, hotels. So you've got to then narrow that down to which ones of those data sets and those white papers are credible, which ones actually are tangible, which ones of those have got some research behind it. So by the time we then netted that down, we actually put this into a Excel spreadsheet 
And we kind of had a formula to understanding it. And in 2021, we went to WTM as our DMC. And we got talking with people and the mood was quite muted, right? We were still in a process of travel restarting and nobody really sure when that officially would be gates open again. And sales conversations, personal conversations, networking was kind of tough. And every now and again, someone would go, hey, what have you guys been up to? And we said, well, actually, we've been thinking about this data set and this platform and this calculator where we could look at the impact of our product, not our business, but our products. And all of a sudden, Dolores, people started putting down their bag. They started taking off their jacket. They started pulling up a seat, right? And we started having really engaged conversations about this. And, you know, there's a classic story that I don't know when it was, but decades ago, Volvo figured out what a seatbelt would do, right? And they thought, you know what, this is so good. We're going to remove all patents, all trademarks, and we're going to say, we don't care who you are. You could be Ford, you could be Peugeot, you could be anybody. Please take our seatbelt because it will have a major impact on human beings in a crash. And I think what we learned from WTM in November 21 was people were saying to us, I don't understand it. I don't know what offsetting is. It's really complex. There's huge barriers for us. We're going to restart. How do we do this? How is it real? Am, am I going to be accused of greenwashing? Is this questionable? And so actually, we came away and thought, do you know what? We need to set this business up and we need to invest in this platform and we need to share this platform across tour operators, principal operators, DMCs, mice players, corporate companies, anybody engaged in the act of moving human beings around the planet to another destination. This is now our calling and this finds us in the wonderful company of you on this call today. Incredible. It makes me think of, you know, a lot of so many of the of the professionals in the in the tourism and travel industry um, pivoting out of the industry, finding you know new ways and new ventures to 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 move on really and to survive. Because obviously, for many, business completely crashed. And um, in your case, instead, you decided to jump right in to the tourism Absolutely. industry as opposed to many others that instead decided to get the check and and move on and move on uh that is it, it's very it's very brave and what i think it's it's remarkable and that's why i wanted to have this conversation with you you looked at it from a product perspective the tourism industry as a whole the travel sphere the hospitality sphere it's all as a a formula of products this plus this plus this equal to this and you really took that formula to the core uh, of 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 the conceptualization of what led you to create um pathnet zero and these products it's actually when i was looking at the way the platform works and it was fascinating to see how every single thing that we experience or do or buy or sell during during the travel experience um, has a has a huge impact and and it nothing I mean there's nothing that is really more or less important than the other. Everything is equally important. So in terms of products, if you look at the way your uh, you know the industry has responded to Pathnet Zero, what would you say are the products that have a the, the biggest negative impact and the products that instead have a positive imp impact as such, whether they are directly positive impacting or or there is an after impact, so to speak, that is somehow positive. I love how you say, I don't want to use the word offsetting when we were, ha were having the recording chat, pre-recording chat. You said, oh, I, I like to use the word rectifying. And I just, yeah, I just wanted to know a little bit more, more about that because as a product equation, everything has an impact. You know, in many ways, at the very, very top level, Dolores, it, it, it's obvious, right? So flights will be the, the number one negative impact in terms of CO2 emissions, right? 
if you are in a position where you travel first class, broadly speaking, you're five times more of a problem than somebody in economy because you're occupying five times more space on that aircraft. Transport is probably your second issue when you look at vehicle transport. So a single car for one person taking them to a resort or a hotel is worse than putting 30 people on a coach or putting 12 people on a minivan. Your other issue is, you know, the, the, the platform's really, really interesting because we've put some stuff in there that actually the impact is reasonably low when you come to a carbon impact measurement. So we can say, for example, a breakfast or a fish lunch, a vegan lunch, or a, a vegan dinner. But we're, we're really, really in this for the long haul ride. So, so we've included stuff in the platform that's for awareness. And a good example, Dolores, is that, you know, I've already told you I love traveling. I travel a lot. And I was recently in Greece. And in this hotel in Greece, which was beautiful, stunning, fantastic, they had a buffet breakfast, right? And I was watching one of the, 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 the tables, a nice couple opposite. And I, I, I think they had donuts pastries toast bread ham cheese salmon sausage tea coffee lemonade right because it's this buffet and i sat there and i thought god imagine if it was a la carte and somebody had come over with a pad and said what would you like for breakfast and if you ordered all of that they'd go okay that's a bit crazy do you want us to bring that out in a particular order? And you say, no, 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 just put it all on the table and we'll just leave what we don't want. And that's exactly what happened. They left half of this stuff and went about their day. And you know and I know the next process on this beautiful Greek island that will happen is that all of that food will be bagged up, it will be stuck in landfill, and it will be disgusting. So whilst we can say you're going to generate three tons or four tons or one and a half tons on a plane, that's accepted, right? And travel and the end user and the consumer understands that. But we also included stuff in the platform to drive debate and drive conversation, which is this is actually the impact of your food. And we even manage that and measure that right down to a single cocktail, right down to a Bellini. And you and I had the conversation, Dolores, that actually a Bellini has very, very little impact until you host a conference and 3,000 people have two of them. Now it's a train. Now it's a truck. Now it's a bus. So the big, big driver for us was, you know, to, to your point of that formula, was giving tour operators, businesses, principal operators, DMCs, mice players, an understanding of if you add all of these things together, there's a consequential output. But the really interesting thing is that the platform allows you to rethink it. So do we take a one-hour domestic flight or do we take a train? The platform will let you know the planetary difference by making that choice. Do we use four, four minibuses or do we use a coach? Do we have a vegetarian lunch or do we have a meat lunch? The platform is also, it, everything comes back to product, right? It's product impact, but it's also a tool that enables you to build product and think about the impact that those various choices those formulas that you'd said A plus B plus C plus D plus E could be five tons or it could be two. Now, that's a material difference and that's worthy of debate within any business to say which one do we want to opt for, which one do we think is more saleable. The other thing with sustainability and this, this market, Dolores, is is it a marketing tool? And actually, for us, it is, right? If, if you were going to do something that was five tons and you've now netted that down and recreated that product to be two, you should talk about that because that's a consumer important message that they should understand. We're not putting you on an hour flight. We're putting you on a two and a half hour train. Sorry for the inconvenience, but this is why.
And this is why we've elected to create our product in that way. And I think that kind of generates a bit of a um, a niche in the niche, so to speak, because if operators start to approach their clients and their business leads or you know potential clients, even those that come out, come, can you send me a proposal about what my holiday would look like if I go want to go there? Here, I give you my budget, and they. And they could say, like, as you just said, look, you can take one hour flight or you can take a bus or a train. And and that's part of our itinerary. And this is how and, and this is why we're telling you that we would like you to take the train, because these are this is this is what is going to generate. And and if that's not OK with you, then then you're not the clients for us. <laughs> then go and go and book your hotel somewhere else. Go and book your holiday somewhere else. What I challenge is the ability of the operators to stay true to that point because you get to the point where you are giving an option to your clients by using the platform. It's like, ah, oh, you know what you can do? You can calculate every single bit of the impact you're having with that, with that travel product. But in the end, the choice sits with the consumers. The choice sits with the travelers. And if they choose, well, you know, I really want to have my buffet when I'm on holidays. I don't want to think about anything else. Do you see compromise in the operators still or those who are into it, those who are committed, they stay true to what they calculate and to, and to the figures that they generate. And then in the end they say, well, you know, this is what we do. And if, if this is not what you're looking for, then you should be looking somewhere else. I struggle to think of a single travel business operator that is selling holidays, trips, tours, conferences, business meetings, involving everything in the platform. I struggle to think, Dolores, of a single one of those that's an NGO and not-for-profit organisation. So we accept, we acknowledge, and we recognise that our partner base have stakeholders, investors, partners, customers and employees who are dependent to pay their mortgage, their rent. We acknowledge, respect and, and understand that in destination, there are communities that rely on people going there for tourism, for holidays, to put money into restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, right? So actually, our, our, our standpoint on that is very, very, very clear. If your business model is sending somebody first class to the Maldives to stay in a five-star island with an infinity pool, with salmon imported from Scotland, with sushi imported in Kobe beef from Japan, and lamb from Australia. Right, if you can charge £20,000 per pax for that, good for you, because the Maldives, as an example, is entirely reliant on tourism and having that influx of cash to that destination. We can argue about leakage, right? I don't know. If it's a big hotel chain, I don't know how much of that leaves that circular economy and goes back to head office, the mothership, somewhere else on the planet. But the pilots that run the water taxis, the guys that run the speedboats, the people that clean the rooms, the people that cook the food, there is an impact where money is staying in there. So we're not saying to that partner, hey, our platform will let you see what happens if people fly economy because that partner's going to say, my customers don't fly economy. That, that's not my lane. That's not my market, right? So we're not trying to, I was going to say, we're not trying to change the world, which is wrong because we are. You know, we're, we're definitely trying to change the world and save the world, but we're not trying to change an operator's model of success we're asking them to recognize it and understand it broadly speaking Dolores we see the cost to correct the impact through verified emission reductions which are some people will call them offsets broadly speaking we see the cost for that is about one percent of the cost of the trip so on that example I've just said there about that, that wonderful first-class flight to the Maldives with a water villa with an infinity pool and KBB from Japan and your sushi and tashimi and all that, if it was £20,000, what we're asking our partner base to do, 
And this is an interesting one because you've already asked me this question, where does the responsibility lie? Is it on the traveller or is it on the operator? We're asking that partner to pick up the phone and go, hey, Dolores, we're really pleased to give you your quote. Your quote is £20,200. And by the way, we've worked out the impact, we've measured it, we've chosen some amazing projects globally, we're going to buy some verified off, uh, uh, emission reductions. Or they can pick up the phone and go, hey, Dolores, your trip is £20,000. For, for me, I, I just heard £20,000, right? I didn't hear 20200 I didn't hear twenty. So that, that 1%, we're asking for a 1% change in revenues and margin across the travel community because it will do good it will add up if the more people that do that the more of those formulas of those little pieces and bits and bobs and piece you know piecemeal will make an impact and it will lead to cleaner energy it will lead to better education it will lead to gender equality it will lead to life above land life above water below water all of the sdgs are the cornerstone of what we're asking people to do. And the cost, in our mind, it's not inconsequential because we accept that travel operators are businesses and a business has a CFO and a CFO has a, an investment board and the investment board have a bank and the bank have targets. We get all of that, but it isn't at the cost of saying don't fly first class fly economy because that's worse right the prevention is worse than the cure i guess what i'm arguing is the as you said you know we we were we were we were discussing about where where is the responsibility sitting you know is in the travelers is in, in who buys or is it in who sells the travel product and and you're sort of in between because you want to help the operators understand understanding what their impact is so that they can therefore explain it to their clients. So what I I guess what I'm arguing here is is the effectiveness of that if the operators per se are not already clear about their niche and their about their type type of clients they want to attract, it will be more and more difficult. Like it will be much harder to for them to try to sell an option to someone that is not educated to understand that option um, or used to understand that option. So nine out of 10, a traveler that is about to buy a travel product put in front of the choice of saying, look, you can have this and this is what you ask me, or you can have this and, and this helps to do this, 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 and this. You will put that traveler into confusion and a confused mind never buys. So the most successful way for operators to actually sell travel products by using you know the 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 functionalities of the platform is to stay in their lane is to be true to what their product stands for and not trying to be everything for everybody because it will decrease their effectiveness of all these beautiful calculations that ultimately are going to help them position a better product. Although you have the operators that still want to kind of play in both worlds, so to speak, uh, there are those instead who choose to, to be in that lane and really go all in. And these are the, the operators I want to talk about. So like in, in this sphere, like especially under the umbrella of your experience and the people you've worked with, the client that have come on board, you know, the members, uh, who is doing the right thing and and what can we learn from them probably the most prolific partners of ours that really engage this i'd say number one are dmcs destination management companies right because the the, the beauty that a dmc has is that they that they're not necessarily dealing with the, the traveler the end user that they're dealing with another corporate or mid-market organization that's then selling this and packaging this right so where they include that, that, that they're bringing another reason to partner with that DMC because they're thinking about it. I think our, our second big space is within group travel. So we have some, particularly in a target of 18 to 35-year-old travellers on group travel, they're really, really engaging it because their audience actually are bothered about this, right? If, if you're 18 to 35, 
that there's a real chance that some of these destinations may not exist for your children. There's a really high chance that they definitely won't exist for your grandchildren. So, so they're, they're bothered, they care, and they're invested. But we also then see a really, really interesting space that, that that's occurring, which is in the luxury market or in FIT. Because ESG, which is environmental, social, governance, broadly speaking, today, Dolores, is voluntary, okay? So if you do CSR, corporate social responsibility, we say to partners, that's the your company's values, right? That's saying you're a good organization, you're good people to work with, you're somebody I want to put my hard-earned money into. That's CSR. ESG is your company value in terms of your share price, your stock price, your multiple, your investors' view on you. Now, interestingly, in the luxury space, if you are a 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80-year-old CEO, in your board meeting this month, someone is going to start talking about environmental social governance, and it's likely that that CEO will say, what is it? And it's, what are we doing as a organization and the social is a really really quick win for many people right if we look at the travel industry and we look at the social people will say we always use local guides where possible we'll always use a locally owned hotel where possible we'll always keep money in the country and not have any leakage we'll always maintain local transport providers we're going to work with a local school we're going to do this charitable work, but the social governance is brilliant. And and one of your questions is, or has been, you know, what is the industry doing really, really well? And for my money, they are making incredible inroads, thoughts, conversations, and actions in destination. They're valuing what makes them the money, right? Because they need that destination to to be there, okay? And they, they need the economy to be there. You'd mentioned about some of the transition and changes and people moving to other roles during 2020, 2021, and they did. One of the big challenges for the travel industry right now is people, because they moved on. They went home. People adapted and they changed. So what people are doing in ESG is brilliant in social. When it comes to the environment, the E element of ESG, that's where PathNet Zero sit, and we say the big, big thing in E is the movement of people around the planet. And that's where we, we, we stay in our lane, right? I get the counter. I think the responsibility lays with the operator. I don't think that if they gave a quote to somebody who was in their 50s, 60s, they don't know what ESG or CSR is, they understand it. I don't think if they pass this charge on to somebody who was 18 to 30, I don't think they'd rebuff it because this is important to them. And for our mind as PathNet Zero, our message to our partners is you're either in or you're out. If you're out, that's fine. We'll walk away. We'll leave you to it. We'll stop the conversation. If you're in, let's make sure that you can be held to account and know that it's truthful, it's factual, it's honest, and it's real. You can't charge somebody a, a, a tiny premium for something that you're not doing. You've got to do it. You've got to put your money where your mouth is. You've got to prove your actions. And that's why we partnered with Gold Standard because Gold Standard have a impact registry. They are verified emission reductions of projects that have ran for at least three years that have been independently verified by the UNWTO and by Gold Standard. They've had the relevant SGDs attributed to them. We literally deliver our partners a certificate with serial numbers on an impact registry that has a cost and that's really really important this company can go to their stakeholders and prove 
in what today is voluntary, and our guess is certainly by 2030, this is mandatory. Probably by 2027, you're going to be need to geared up and ready for it. And I think as close as 2025, if this isn't on your agenda, you're behind the curve and you're behind the market. And that is the big thing with PathNet Zero is genuine, factual, data-driven proof that you're doing this and you're doing it correctly. It's the responsibility we keep on bringing back in this conversation. And and you just said it's in the operators. And I couldn't help but thinking, if you as an operator already, you don't have a clear range of clients that know exactly what is it that you're giving, you could be promising this and that to the client. But at the end of the day, does the client want that? Does the client want to fly first class to the Maldives? Yes, he does. If you if you if you propose, if you give an option to go, like you know, you could go economy, and the guys are like, no, thanks, I still want to go first class. So that's why an operator should have absolute clarity on the target clients they are going to serve once they embark on this journey with you and with you with PathNet Zero as a tool for them, but in general with their with what their strategy is all about. And as you said, the timeline is speaking by itself. And yeah. and, and we see it. Some are already pioneering it and some others are like waiting for things to get a little bit cheaper and simpler so that they can get on board but in the yeah. end if it i see this as a successful tool implementation for an, a tourism operator only if that operator has absolute clarity on the type of clients he wants to use this tool with and for yes. correct it will not be as effective and in fact it will cause frustration further down the line with the stakeholders and the company uh, results if the tools is impl- the tool is implemented but the clients are not responding to it so before starting a game of blame of a blame of who to blame along this process what i want to do is to have absolute clarity of how does it work for an operator when it comes on board with pathnet zero can you tell us like how does that process work yeah absolutely so so, so the process that we we go through with any new partner is it, it, the first thing, Dolores, is, is to understand where are they on their ESG journey, right? Why is it important? Why are they doing it? What's the value proposition that they're going to get from that? And we also try to get under the skin in terms of an organization, what's important to them. So we rarely meet an organization that doesn't look after their people. We rarely meet an organization that doesn't organize fundraising events for its local community. We rarely meet an organization that isn't thinking about their own sustainability and the destinations they work in. So so ordinarily, we're in contact with somebody because either consciously or not, they've already got elements of corporate social responsibility embedded into their business, and they're asking the question of their product. They've got to a point in their journey where it's fearful that it's complex, it's not understandable, it's non-affordable, it could be greenwashing, it's non-factual. So so our initial conversations are about breaking down those barriers and, and, and that sort of border to saying, look, we can help you with this. If you think about some of our partners that there's some real obvious people as to why they want to do it. We've got partners in places like Namibia. We have partners in, we've already mentioned it a lot, the Maldives. We have partners based in Monaco, right? And and the next stage of that engagement is understanding what they sell, how much of it they sell, what the key drivers are in terms of the impact. Now, interestingly, I would say, Comfortably, six out of 10 people that we meet don't have international or domestic flights in their product. They've got the hotel, the transfer, the food, right? So a very, very straightforward itinerary. Now, when you take out the big ticket items, when we work out the impact of that trip, it's actually very, very low. And therefore, the commercial barrier 
disappears immediately, right? They're not flying somebody first class. They're not even flying them economy. They're collecting them from the airport. They're taking them to a three, four star hotel for seven to 14 nights with bed and breakfast. So you're suddenly, you're not talking about two tons or three tons. You're talking about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.35 tons. So it becomes really, really measurable and affordable within the product but it gives them the ability to let their customers know that they've thought about it and they're thinking about it and they're working on it. And there's another really, really interesting space in those initial conversations, which is, you know, any travel business, any operator, any DMC, they should be thinking about what their business looks like in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 30 years' time. I know they've not got a business plan that's 30 years old, Dolores. That's impossible, right? But they should have the appetite for legacy and longevity of their brand. Their customers in that 10, 20, 30-year cycle are going to be very, very different to their customers today. They're going to have very, very different buying appetites and buying criterias and destinations will measurably potentially have changed if they're not thinking about their three-year business plan now to protect their business plan in 30 years. So in terms of that question around where the responsibility lies, you know, one could argue that a sensible business plan would be to maintain the destinations that people will visit and to think about what the future traveler may look like. And for our opinion, that thought process needs to start now because that future traveler, you know, he or she is currently in primary school or he or she is currently in school. In, in 10 years' time, they're going to get a great job. They're going to be a pop star. They're going to be a factory worker they're going to be a mum they're going to be a dad they're going to be a teacher they're still going to want to travel right they're still going to want to be on holiday so a big part of our consultation is thinking about your own business as well i wouldn't take it as far as to say people plan at profit which people often say and it's a reasonable phrase and we could I'm sure you and I could debate people, planet, profit for hours, Dolores, right? And how those pillars sit with each other. But they are interlinked. And if you work in travel, you need a planet and you need people willing to travel around it. And you need profit to pay your staff in order to sell that. And, and, and there is a link, you know, quite where you, you, you put those pillars. PathNet Zero have zero intention of telling a business how to sell telling them what to sell, telling them who to sell that to, or telling them how to operate. Our principal purpose as a trading company is to help a travel organization understand the impact of their product, to show them how they can calculate that, and then to give them a means to prove that they care and they've done something about it. Now, it may be, Dolores, that somebody takes us upon one of those things. Right? They may say, I want to I work out the impact of my trip. I, I want to be able to let people know that this is five tons. I can't force those guys to do something about it. But their organization, if they don't want to force themselves to do something about it, I guarantee you in the next decade, their customers will vote with their feet. The question is, do we need to get to that point? And how can we avoid getting to that point? Why is it that in the tourism industry, we often see operators of various kinds, like public sector or private sector, somehow always waiting for the consumers to really become loud and louder and louder and voicing what is it that they want so that they can adjust and then they play it safe. It's like, oh, that's what the consumers want. That's what the travelers want. So let's do it because the market demands it. Why is it that we can't go there before it gets requested, you know, and, and sort of lead the demand, not just answering to it, you know? And I hope that but by using the tools that are available on PathNet Zero, in a way, 
we we are moving into a leading position rather than in a in a responding position you know you we move actively rather than passively in in putting forward a better a better industry a better a better way to work a better way to travel uh and and to not just to give people a a choice but to educate them about that choice before and uh and and just when you think you know it all you you keep on chasing keep on chasing keep on chasing and the question is what is it exactly that the operators are chasing today and one of one conversation i had earlier today it struck me with the the subject of influence and the influence that media has on people today in constantly telling people what they should be doing, what they should be knowing, why they're not doing it. You should be this, you should be that. And and how we constantly live in a projected reality of ourselves, in this projected version of what we should believe in and what we should be acting on and what you, and everything that relates to how we go about our daily life. And somehow I think that in relation to our conversation today, that there's a lot of buzz around uh, in the traveler's sphere and in the travelers. There's a lot of buzz about uh, how to go about your travel choices, what to do, what not to do. And, and how are you traveling responsibly moving forward? So it's almost like there's a, an indo- indoctrination of, of media in the, to imprint in people's brain that from now on the the thing to do is to travel responsibly and this is happening every day in everything in social media on internet in general through newspapers news channels just you know you you can just put together a few news channels that talk about travel and you will easily align the same message so whether this message is going out because there's a hidden agenda behind it or because the media corporation really believe that this is a powerful message to share, um, what, what happens in the end is that these, con- these travelers, in this case, consuming travel products, they're going to ask for more of this. They're going to, because it's going to be Im- imprinted in their in their thinking process when they make travel choices. If you look at it from a business perspective, yes, your pitch is the benefits that ultimately utilizing the platform, the benefits that will be brought to the, you know, the financial returns of a company. I see it from a traveler's perspective, whereby these are the travel products that should be created moving forward regardless. And one of the questions that have been brought up in many of the travel forums is, when we when we look at projects that are implemented sort of you know within the credit system or within the range of activities and actions that are taken if we're going somewhere we want we're making an impact we're having an impact on that place on that destination on these people how can i choose to help the people and the place that i'm going to instead of something else and somewhere else and someone else on the other side of the world. And this is possible on the platform because there's a whole range of projects, right, that you undertake and you believe in and you bring in. And all these projects are transparent and acknowledged and certified and most importantly, non-renewable, right? You were telling me about the fact that once a project is completed, it's completed. It, that, that's, it's not something that can be sold over and over again on along the same line. Give me, give me just an example of a completion when something comes to a completion, and then another another member that comes on the platform can't go on that because that is completed. Absolutely. So, so, so what you have is a project is issued with what's called a VER, which is a verified emission reduction. Each one of those VERs equals one credit, and one credit equals one tonne of CO2E that has been prevented from being released into the atmosphere. We have a project, and make it really, really easy maths, Dolores, right? Let's say one project released, uh, stopped 50 tonnes of CO2E being released to the atmosphere. That's then issued with 50 
individual serial numbers that are allocated to each credit. Now, if Dolores Travel decided to buy 25 of those, it's then what's called retired. So 25 of those 50, 25 of those serial numbers are retired from available stock. They're issued and certified to you, never to be resold, never to be repeated. They're gone, right? They've been purchased. It's done. So the beauty of what we do is that it, it can't be resold. It can't be replicated. Once that 50 have sold out, so then if Mark Travel comes along and I take the other 25, project sold out. It's done. Never to be repeated. It can't be replanted. It can't be replicated. It can't be reproduced. The, the, the terminology that applies to it is that they are now retired. But the big thing that I was thinking when you were talking was, whose responsibility is it? And I thought, you know what, if you, if you put a checkbox on a checkout, Stopping short of saying, do you care about the planet, tick yes or no, and guilting people into correcting their, their travels. But the big example that I thought about in terms of, of, of how you lead is if this is why tour operators and travel industry has to lead it on behalf of the traveller. If you and I went out on the street tomorrow, let's, let's say we chose a really common commuter street the same 100 people pass there every day at 8 30 and you and i went with a clipboard and each of us in turn said to somebody do you approve of litter it's a yes or no question and they go no of course i don't tick right i reckon we get close to a hundred well if we go out the next day and if i put some litter in the middle of that street how many people that did the survey yesterday would pick it up and put it in the bin and i would wager none of them because it's not their problem. When it comes to it, and when a push comes to shove, they don't like litter, they don't litter, they don't approve of waste. But I'm going to walk past that, and I'm not going to do anything about it. And if travel operators put that in the gift of the traveller, we will stay in the situation that we are, time and time again, cycle and cycle. They've got to take responsibility. They've got to acknowledge a environmental impact has a financial cost that they need to find a way to mitigate. The, the shift is happening in the traveller spheres, but a faster shift needs to happen in the business sphere, in the operator spheres. So the work that you do with PathNet Zero helps that shift going a little bit faster. Uh, but never, nonetheless, I think it's it's incredible even just to be able to to have scientific data, facts, um, and researches that can back these figures and help us understand what a number really means. And I invite everyone that has listened to this podcast that I'm sure could go on and on and on, but I'm conscious of the time uh, and the conversation we've had to head over to the show notes and visit the website of PathNet Zero, browse around and get in contact with Mark if you have any questions. Thank you so much for being such a generous speaker and guest on this on this podcast. And there's so much we have touched on and so much more to talk about. So it's definitely not the last time. Perfect. Dolores, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today on Truth Behind Troll podcast, the first episode of season four, focusing on impact. And today with Mark, we spoke about the white elephant in the room. I know the conversation has been long, but if you are still here and you're still listening the very end of this podcast, I encourage you to get over the show notes and get in touch with PathNet Zero if you want to know more about the impact of your travel product. While you're at it, don't forget to head over our social channel and give us a follow or a like. Let us know you're there. Send us a review or a comment. Get in touch. This is not one-way conversation. Thank you so much and we speak soon again.